Once upon a time in Mexico, a fugitive drug lord named El Chapo made his way through a secret tunnel on the way to freedom in a place that nobody could find. Not the police, not the DEA, not the military, not the government, but there was one person who was able to gain access to this killer cartel king. And that person was Oscar-winning actor Sean Penn. El Chapo is an infamous, iconic drug trafficker. And Sean Penn played an iconic drug smoker. It was a match made in heaven. A gangster who wants to be a movie star, and a movie star who wants to be a gangster? This was all truly stranger than fiction. The story that they want us to believe is that Sean Penn's mission was to simply interview El Chapo for Rolling Stone magazine. But many claim that Sean Penn's motivation was to get the life rights to play El Chapo in a movie. But none of that matters because this real life is more wild than that movie would have ever been. Besides murderous drug lord El Chapo and Venezuelan dictator Hugo Chavez, Sean Penn has spent his life seeking out the most interesting of friends and mentors. Sean befriended the likes of Marlon Brando, Jack Nicholson, Hunter S. Thompson, and Charles Bukowski, always surrounding himself with flawed, genius poet bad boys. Cause that's who Sean Penn really wants to be. A poet. Or a gangster which most of the characters he plays can be put into either of those two categories. Poets, or gangsters, or Angry Birds. But lately it feels like we've been seeing Sean Penn's face more on CNN and Fox News than in movie theaters. So let's find out just what the f happened to Sean Penn. But to truly understand what the f happened to Sean Penn, we must begin at the beginning and the beginning began when he was born on his birthday. Santa Monica, California, 1960. Born to a showbiz family of performers and artists, he sure did try his darndest to be seen as a tough guy from the streets and not a rich kid Malibu brat. When he was just a kid, his blacklisted director of a father would cast him in Little House on the Prairie. But his first movie role came in 1981, with Taps, launching him and Tom Cruise into the limelight. But the real breakout came the following year, playing a pizza-ordering, marijuana-smoking, authority-questioning, wave-surfing Jeff Spicoli in the classic teen comedy, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. This is a performance that still stands as the greatest stoner character ever made, uh, except for maybe the Le Big Lebowski, you could argue, I don't know. With this character, Sean becomes a master at comedic timing. Every line is delivered with pitch perfection. All other stoner surfer dude characters are just pathetic imitations. Sean Penn was so believable that many thought he was just a real surfer dude who just happened to wander into a movie. But young Sean took this silly role serious, diving into surf culture and basing his performance off real people, which would really help this character not fall into the over-the-top cartoon category. Hey bud, <laughs> let's party! <laughs> But to prove that he was not just a hilarious one-trick stoner pony, Sean Penn would next give his first important dramatic role as a troubled teen named Mick in Bad Boys, not the Will Smith one. And of course, Sean Penn chose the method acting way to bring this character to life. Then he would do some very interesting films that didn't really do much, like Crackers, and Racing with the Moon. Penn next would give a remarkable performance as a real-life drug dealer, Andrew Dalton Lee, convicted of being a Soviet spy. In the film, The Falcon and the Snowman in 1985, Sean Penn even hired the real-life Andrew Dalton Lee as his assistant, 
You know, being around the real guy probably helped him get into character. Sean Penn would follow that up with another incredible turn in At Close Range in 1986. Then Sean Penn married Madonna. Helicopters circled their Malibu ceremony, and legend has it Sean Penn fired his pistol at the choppers. Their relationship was filled with paparazzi, scandal, chaos, and controversy. Their most embarrassing professional moment probably came in 1986 when they co-starred together in the Razzie Darling, Shanghai Surprise, earning Sean Penn a Worst Actor nomination. Bum, bum, bah. It was around this time that Sean Penn first stated that he was done with acting, but that was far from true. Like many celebrities, Sean Penn does not enjoy flashing cameras in his face everywhere he goes, so he had a very complicated, difficult relationship with the paparazzi. Getting into numerous altercations of fights with the paparazzi and, and people like that. Get the f out! Madonna would soon file for divorce in 1987 and then again in 1989 when rumor has it that Sean Penn allegedly struck Madonna with a baseball bat, and also allegedly tied her to a chair and, like, tortured her for hours or something. But Madonna has since denied any physical abuse, and the two seem to be friendly, so I don't know what to think about that. But there was also another incident around that time when Sean Penn punched an extra on the set of Colors. Cause the extra took photos of him and you know, the punishment for taking photos of Sean Penn is a punch! But the punishment for punching is, you know, jail time, which Sean Penn got. Sean Penn, Robert Duvall, in a Dennis Hopper film, Colors. But Mr. Sean Penn would have a jolly good time making fun of his reputation as an angry, crazy, maniac person by hosting Saturday Night Live. You know, poking fun at his violent image. It's okay, cause he has a sense of humor about it, right? Sean Penn rounded out the 1980s with Judgment in Berlin, directed by his father, an unfunny film called We're No Angels, and another unfunny film called Casualties of War. But that one wasn't supposed to be funny, so that's okay. In Casualties of War, which is a Vietnam drama, Sean Penn gives yet another strong turn that showed that despite some professional missteps and personal issues, he is one of the greatest actors to emerge that decade. And under the direction of Brian De Palma, young Sean Penn gives a terrifying performance that really shows us the horrors of war and how dehumanizing it truly can be. And with the first half of the 1990s, Sean Penn would bring a streak of genius with him, starting with the film State of Grace, and his commendable directorial debut, The Indian Runner, leading into his first Golden Globe-nominated and incredibly unflattering performance in Carlitos Way, reteaming with master filmmaker Brian De Palma, where he plays Al Pacino's scuzzball weasel of a lawyer, whose head is full of mighty curls of corruption and greed. I believe that Sean Penn showed up on the set with his head all permed, the studio was not too happy because he looked like a not Sean Penn, but it was too late to do anything about it, and it works really well. And then came a wonderful film directed by Tim Robbins called Dead Man Walking, in which he played a man on death row facing his final days as he befriends a nun played by Susan Sarandon who won an Oscar for this. And I'm sure Sean Penn helped in a way, I guess. Speaking of Oscars, Sean Penn was nominated too, and boy howdy does he deserve it because this is one of the most complex, dramatic performances of that entire decade, the 90s. Sean Penn was able to meet with some real-life inmates on death row, 
in order to prepare for the roll. Imagine being on death row and, you know, you're like about to die and then they're like, hey, Sean Penn wants to study you. With this performance, Sean brings relatable fear and humanity to this murderer. Something that only a top-notch performer can do. Something that only Sean Penn can probably do. That same year, he got back into the director's chair, making a movie called The Crossing Guard that earned a Golden Lion nomination at the Venice Film Festival. And director Sean Penn was able to get one of the best Jack Nicholson performances to come out of the 1990s. One year later, he married actress Robin Wright, who sometimes went by Robin Wright Penn, and they had an on-again, off-again relationship. I know, I know, but I need to explain. I need you to understand. I understand. Then came 1997, which was very busy for Mr. Sean Penn. This included standouts like his powerhouse performance as a man slipping into madness in the film She's So Lovely, which got him a nomination for Best Actor at the Cannes Film Festival. And he did a very fine job leading the Oliver Stone film U-Turn, which was followed by a very nice supporting turn in David Fincher's The Game. All of this would lead to two films in 1998, Hurley Burley, where he plays another sleazy snake of a man, and the World War II epic masterpiece, The Thin Red Line. Reportedly, he was so desperate to work with then-reclusive filmmaker Terrence Malick, who at that time hadn't made a film in decades. He hadn't been seen in decades. Sean Penn was basically willing to work for free. All he needed to know was where to show up. This is a wonderful film with a wonderful ensemble cast, such a great cast that's so big that it, you actually forget who's in this movie, but you never forget that Sean Penn's in it. At least I don't. Mr. Sean Penn would round out the 1990s with yet another terrific film. Sweet and Low Down, playing a 1930s jazz guitarist for Woody Allen, earning an Oscar nomination for this comedic performance. Master filmmaker Woody Allen trusted Sean Penn so much that he never really gave him any direction. Woody Allen didn't even know what Sean Penn's character's voice was going to sound like until the cameras rolled. And then Sean Penn started just doing this wacky, goofy thing, and Woody Allen was like, okay. And Sean Penn was like, okay, I guess we're doing this. And it worked! Once again, he was completely dedicated to the role, and lived with his guitar teacher, in order to master the accurate finger movements of all the songs. But he was never able to produce a pleasant sound. They fixed that in post. And after working on Sweet and Lowdown, Sean Penn said that he never wanted to touch a guitar again. Then came the new millennium, where he would direct an incredible film called The Pledge, reteaming with his buddy Jack Nicholson. And this one earned much praise at the Cannes Film Festival. Next came the movie I Am Sam, with Sean Penn playing a father with special needs who is fighting for the custody of his daughter, a teeny tiny Dakota Fanning. To prepare for the role, Sean Penn would hang out at an art center for individuals with special needs, and he ended up casting some of the actors he met at this center to play his friends in the movie. And you know what? I am okay that Sean Penn goes full Tropic Thunder here, because even though sometimes it's a little much, it is done with nothing but love. The soundtrack is full of beautiful Beatles covers, and the handheld camera work elevates this performance beyond desperate Oscar bait, even though this is desperate Oscar bait. But that doesn't mean that it's not good. Okay, what do, what do you mean? Sean Penn also lost many fans when he was one of the first major Hollywood stars to blast President George W. Bush. And I know that that doesn't seem very controversial right now, but at the time, it was right after 9-11. And everybody everywhere was talking about uniting, you know, because 9-11, like, just happened. But no, right away, Sean Penn was like, Fuck George Bush, he's a war criminal. And remember, this was before the Iraq War. But basically, Sean Penn was talking smack about George W. before it was cool. Is it cool? I don't know. What? 
Ah! But all that political controversy it didn't really seem to hurt his career too much because next he would win Best Actor in Clint Eastwood's masterpiece Mystic River, where Sean Penn gives one of the most soul-shattering performances ever captured on film as a father coping with his daughter's murder. And I will never ever forget that epic, heartbreaking, crying scene where Sean Penn has to be held back by like 15 police officers, and you can tell that they're really holding him back. He is using every inch of his body to act. <laughs> and the way his voice cracks as he's calling out screaming plays like tragic music. This is my daughter! And then Sean Penn beautifully turns his grief into thirst for violent revenge. And that very same year came a gritty, non-linear drama called 21 Grams, which would have won him another Oscar if it didn't come out the same year as Mystic River. He plays a man facing death in the face, and all those emotions, they also beautifully turn into a thirst for violent revenge. Then Sean Penn would do the celebrity activism thing and actually went to Iraq. And I'm sure his heart was in the right place, but all of his Iraq adventures would kind of come back to bite him in his puppet ass. When all of that was overshadowed, when he was satirized and criticized in the hilarious film Team America World Police, which depicted Sean Penn as a full-blown head case. Sean Penn took it in stride as as best as Sean Penn could, which meant he wrote a public letter to Trey Parker and Matt Stone, kind of getting mad at them because he claims that these jokes that these South Park guys were telling were not going to stop the re-election of George W. Bush or something. But the South Park guys were like, what? No, we're the South Park guys. We don't care about anything. Kapla! Kapla! Sean Penn would continue to star in movies that were very interesting, yet lackluster. You know, movies that had potential, but just, uh, didn't really do it. Like The Assassination of Richard Nixon in 2004, The Interpreter in 2005, and All the King's Men in 2006. In addition to a very strange voice performance in the English version of Persepolis in 2007. During this tepid run, Sean Penn would focus most of his energy on disaster relief, aiding in the Hurricane Katrina cleanup. And I don't really care, uh, love him or hate him, Sean Penn, he actually walks the walk, and actually took a boat to New Orleans to help. He also brought his camera crew, but yeah, whatever. The dude literally pulled people from the floodwaters. That's badass, <laughs> you know? Hard to criticize that. Imagine getting rescued and realizing you're in the arms of Sean Penn. He would also go to Iran and Cuba as a quote-unquote celebrity journalist. And like I said, love him or hate him, Sean Penn goes out there and gets his hands dirty, which is way more than most virtue signaling celebrities can say. But then he started getting cozy with Hugo Chavez. And that kind of rubbed most people the wrong way. And I will wish him nothing but that great strength he has shown over and over again. In the year 2007, Sean Penn also directed what could be his most challenging and haunting and rewarding work, a film called Into the Wild. In this movie, you can really feel Sean Penn's vision and voice. He knows what details to pay attention to to best elevate the story. It's a beautiful movie based on a heartbreaking true story that is incredibly accurate and has a legendary soundtrack by his good friend Eddie Vedder. Then Sean Penn would find himself starring in Gus Van Zandt's Milk, based on the life and death of Harvey Milk. Sean Penn constantly studied documentary footage of Mr. Milk to make sure that he got every line and every mannerism accurate to the real man. This was in addition to listening to It's Raining Men every morning before work. 
It's a tender human performance that earned him his second Oscar. Plus, he got to kiss James Franco, but like, who hasn't? I would like to announce my candidacy for San Francisco City Supervisor. The next decade began with not only his divorce from Robin Wright, but another run-in with a paparazzi, this time leading to anger management. While he was doing other very admirable contributions to another devastating natural disaster, the Haiti earthquake. It was at this time that Sean Penn chose to focus more on charitable causes instead of a Three Stooges movie. Which is kind of funny because recently I saw a meme that says Sean Penn looks like all Three Stooges rolled into one now. Which is really mean, but funny. But we can always count on Sean Penn's comments to get him in hot water, and that happened again in 2010. After defending his buddy, Venezuelan president dictator Hugo Chavez, when people, you know, called him a dictator. Sean Penn was like, this dictator is not a dictator, because he's my friend. Sean Penn would then call for journalists who called his buddy Hugo a dictator to be locked up. Which kind of sounds like a dictator. This is a mild foreshadowing of his critically panned horrendous novel, Bob Honey, Who Just Do Stuff. Yeah, that's the title. Bob Honey, Who Just Do Stuff. The book is about an assassin and is somehow a strange criticism of the Trump administration or something. I don't know, I didn't read it, I just heard it sucks and I'm gonna believe those people who say it sucks. So it sucks! But the actor does say that he enjoys writing more than acting, and I say do what you love. After the unremarkable film Fair Game, he would team up again with legendary filmmaker Terrence Malick for the film The Tree of Life. Sean Penn gives a very strong performance that's hidden in there somewhere. Most of this movie is just really beautiful cinematography and stuff, with Sean Penn and Brad Pitt whispering into your ear. But it is a very beautiful, complicated, divisive film, which can be called a masterpiece. It's got dinosaurs. But I'm not exactly sure Sean Penn was a fan. He said that the structure of the movie robbed it of any emotion. But I think these dinosaurs disagree. Next came a very interesting, unusual film called This Must Be The Place, where Sean Penn plays a former rock star who tracks down a Nazi. It sounds better than it is. It's just a movie that kind of fails to connect properly. Interesting but unbalanced. This actor would then get back to his activism by visiting flooded areas in Pakistan and he brought aid. Then he teamed up with Kid Rock to make what they called a public service film called Americans, which was supposed to bring us all together and unite as a country, but I don't think it worked. From there, Sean Penn played gangster Mickey Cohen in 2013's Gangster Squad, which was a bland, generic gangster movie, but he's good, you know. Sean did give quite a compelling performance that same year in a movie called The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. You know, that Ben Stiller movie. This is more like a cameo, but Sean Penn really makes the most of it and brings life to this movie. Then he attempted to do the Liam Neeson thing and tried to be like an elderly action star in a movie called The Gunman, which was a major misfire. But hey, at least his voice role as the grunting bird in the Angry Birds movie showed that he still had a sense of humor. But his next directorial effort, The Last Face, did not show that he still had a sense of humor. Good talk. Nice chatting with you. Then came the year 2015, when Sean Penn interviewed drug lord El Chapo, one of the biggest, most deadliest drug lords in history. This was under discreet conditions, and without any advice or supervision from the American government. Sean Penn did it all on his own, with only the help of a telenovela actress and Oliver Stone's producers. He was taken deep into the jungle to perform this Rolling Stone interview that lasted seven hours where this odd couple shared beers and tacos. Sean Penn said that meeting El Chapo was like meeting Scarface and insisted on taking a photo of the two shaking hands. But 
no smiles allowed. Because this is very serious. He fucking kills people. They would plan to meet again for a follow-up interview that would be more in-depth, I guess? A deep dive into El Chapo? But they were only able to get an over-the-phone, low-res video interview where Sean Penn asks hard-hitting El Chapo-approved questions. Like, do you dream? This violent, murderous drug lord was captured soon after his meetup with the Oscar-winning actor. But Sean Penn swears that he had nothing to do with it, y'all. But he does regret the meeting and calls it a failure, because all of the focus was on his celebrity rather than the issue of drug trafficking, which is bad. Here comes Santa Claus! In 2018, he appeared very jet-lagged and drugged up on Ambien when he illegally lit a cigarette on The Stephen Colbert Show. Then Sean went on to talk about how he lost his passion for acting. This left many people asking, is he doing okay? But it also felt like he was kind of playing up his public persona for some laughs, because Stephen Colbert's supposed to be funny. And yeah, everybody knows that Sean Penn is considered a very far leftist Democrat. But Sean Penn has shown that he can piss off everybody from all political sides. When he dared criticize woke culture on Bill Maher's podcast, and he spoke on Adam Carolla's podcast on the quote-unquote societal cannibalism and hypocrisy of the hashtag MeToo movement and cancel culture, he even wrote a horrible poem about all of this, which I shall read now. There are no men nor women, only movements own the day, until the movements morph to mayhem and militaries chip away. Whether North Korean missiles or marching Tehran's way, where did all the laughs go? Are you there, Louis C.K.? He next turned to something that he rarely did, television, with the sci-fi drama series The First which would mark his first time on television, except for Little House on the Prairie. He must have liked being on that TV because in 2020, he co-starred in a Watergate drama called Gaslit. And then he went on to call people who didn't get the coronavax criminals while promoting his most recent film, Flag Day, always squeezing in some political controversy into his movie career. He directed this movie, Flag Day, and it co-stars his daughter. So that's kind of cool. Speaking of things that are kind of cool, Paul Thomas Anderson movies. And Sean Penn was in one. The amazing film called Licorice Pizza, where he has a very small supporting turn that is very memorable. The movie just stops and becomes the Sean Penn show during his time on screen, and it's amazing. I hope he works with Paul Thomas Anderson some more. Today, Sean Penn's political activism is as strong as ever. The dude hasn't slowed down. Really, just take any major controversial political global issue, and you can probably find Penn's thoughts on it, and his thoughts are probably gonna piss half of y'all off. His latest venture is in the defense of Ukraine, even loaning President Zelensky his Oscar statue. The milk one, I think. I'm sure he meant well, but this is like a vulgar display of celebrity self-importance. I know that Zelensky is an actor himself, but what the f*** is he gonna do with your Oscar, Sean? It's just gonna take up space now, and he has to lug it around, and I hear that Oscars are very heavy. Unless they're gonna melt this unholy golden idol down and make bullets out of it, then I don't think it's gonna do much for the cause. Sean Penn has pumped out some of the greatest performances ever captured on film for the last four decades. And he has stood up for what he believes in for at least as long as that. But yeah, at least Sean Penn is trying to do something positive with his fame. While other celebrities flood us with tweets, he goes out to the flooded streets. In recent years, 
his humanitarian efforts have taken priority over his movie making. Plus, even Sean Penn admits that Sean Penn is difficult to work with, which can always slow down your career a bit. And he just does not love acting anymore. So here you got a case of an artist who has conquered their craft and done enough and now wants to do something new, their own thing. And I think that's cool, even if it's Louis C.K. poetry. I think Sean Penn said it best when he told us that his pool is heated and he doesn't care what we think. <laughs> so yeah, he does not give a f about what the f we think, so you should not give a f about what the f happened to Sean Penn, because he's doing just fine.